Well, good morning, church family. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. You know that's the last chapter, don't you? It's the last chapter after a year and a half of walking through the book of Acts. We have two sermons left in the book of Acts. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that Bible as a gift from us to you. You can make it your own, okay? It is yours. Mark in it, highlight anything. Keep it. You need a copy of God's Word. A snapshot of my life in the summer of 2003. I had just quit my job as an engineer, hoping for the Lord's guidance that he would open a door. I had no clarity about what was actually going to take place, and instead, door after door were shut in my face, and in the interim, I was mowing yards. I was married at this point, so my wife was along for the ride. My friends and family thought that I was insane. Some of them thought that I was acting like a giant baby and just needed to grow up. To be honest, I didn't even understand what I was wrestling with in my own heart. Now, in hindsight, I can look back And actually understand I was wrestling with some of the deepest questions of my soul. Wrestling with God like Jacob. That wrestling actually has led to me being here. But on the outside looking in, it looked like utter foolishness. This moment was probably the most misunderstood that I've ever been in my life. Maybe you've had moments where you felt completely misunderstood. From the outside looking in, no one understood what was going on in there. And maybe you didn't, like me, didn't even quite understand it yourself. Now, in our passage today, we will see that Paul is completely misunderstood by multiple groups. From the outside looking in, no one understands him. If he was seeking the approval of others, he would be in schizophrenic at this point, right? Because they, they change their opinions of him like the weather. Instead, Paul sought the approval of one. He performs for the audience of one and is content to let the world think, think whatever it thinks. You see, God will defend Paul's honor. God will give Paul platforms to reach people. It's certainly not because Paul is placating to the opinions of other people. Now, I think you and I can actually learn a great deal of ourselves this morning as we watch and examine what happens to Paul about the way that we respond to other people's opinions. So listen, as I read in Acts chapter 28, I'm going to read the first four verses. When they had been brought safely through, then they found out that they were on the island which is called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain had set us in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on Paul's hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began to say to one another, undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have gathered this morning in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And we have gathered to sing your praise and to pray to your name and and to hear from your word. And we pause right now to say to you in our hearts that we welcome, we long for your Holy Spirit to teach us. 
to speak through me and to convict our hearts however you see fit, God. Because Holy Spirit, when you convict us, you heal us. We even invite you to expose areas of our life where we are holding on to the opinion of others and and it is causing us to be tossed around in the sea or, uh, Father, to to not obey and to follow you but to be uh, enchained by, by their opinion instead of yours. And so this morning, we long to fix our eyes upon you but we need you to pull back the veil and to remove the scales from our eyes so that we could see you with, clear, with clarity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right, so recall from last week, we are in the middle of Paul's journey and shipwreck. Luke and Aristarchus have joined Paul, leaving Caesarea in late August of AD 59. Julius is the centurion that is in charge of Paul's transport. He has with him uh, a dozen other guards as well. They are transporting a number of other convicts. Now in Myra, they aboard a large Egyptian grain ship that is going to carry uh, 276 souls. That's crewmen and passengers Just wrap your mind around the fact that like, it's going to be just a snapshot of society with with Italians and Egyptian businessmen, uh, men and women and children and uh, craftsmen, all all sorts are going to be aboard this. Now, that season, the weather did not cooperate. Now, while they they hoped to... uh, port in the port of Phoenix off the island of Crete. They hoped to port there for the winter. A storm came through and blew them out to sea. And we saw that they were battered by the wind and the waves in the open ocean. The storm tossed them violently. For 14 days, they were lost at sea. They had no bearings and and. The only thing that they were assured of is that every one of them thought that they were going to lose their lives, except Paul. And God used Paul at that moment to rise up in leadership and to shine the light and the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because an angel came to him and told Paul that everyone would live, but they would run aground on a certain island. So as we open to chapter 28, that island is Malta. It is 50 miles south of Italy. The natives from the island, they see the shipwreck, right? You you see that, and now they, they see 276 people fighting to get aboard, or to get ashore. Everyone is alive, just as God had promised through Paul. The natives are a tribal people with a native tongue that sounds like babbling to Greeks and Romans. They are actually looked down upon by the Greeks and Romans. However, they are incredibly hospitable, kind and warm. They do everything that they can to help all those who've been shipwrecked, including food and a fire. Now, Paul is around the fire, and he wishes to be a servant. He wishes to serve the group. And so, he, he gathers together some firewood to put upon there. And as he reaches down into the wood to kindle the fire, suddenly a viper comes and latches onto his hand. It hangs on, dumping all of his venom into Paul. You got to be thinking, great, Okay. It wasn't stoning, it wasn't assassination attempts, it wasn't shipwrecks for shipwrecks, it is a stinking viper that's going to take our hero out. But Paul just shakes it off in the fire, unfazed, because Jesus has promised him that he will reach Rome. Look at verse 4 again. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. 
Now, Justice was the name of a Greek goddess who did exactly that, okay? Executed justice upon those who were evil. So their cultural narrative was that any time calamity or hardship hit, it was because evil spirits were bringing punishment from the gods. And now it all made sense to them, right? This shipwreck that threatened 276 lives was really caused because there was a small group of criminals aboard. There were wicked, evil people on that ship. And now the goddess Justice has singled out the very worst of them all. The worst, this viper has sealed his fate. He is unrighteous. He is wicked to the core. And he is getting what he deserves. Now, while justice catching up to the wicked certainly is a biblical category, the Bible warns us against thinking so simplistically. Job clearly teaches us that uh, the righteous suffer. This is a perfect example of what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Do not judge lest you be judged. And by your standard of measure that you apply to others, it will be measured to you. Now, I know this is confusing for us because our culture likes to apply this verse, do not judge universally. Okay, we hear that all the time as if, oh, no one's allowed to judge for anything. Okay, so let me provide some clarity here about how as believers we are supposed to think about this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there is a man in the church who's sleeping with his stepmom, and the church isn't doing anything about it. And so Paul writes to them and tells them to judge him, to bring the matter before the church and to remove him from membership. And then he closes that chapter and he says, listen, you are not to judge the world, but rather you are are to judge those who are within the church, okay? In other words, quick criteria. One, that is Christians are supposed to be, are are supposed to hold Christians to Christian standards. You can't hold the world to Christian standards because they don't know Christ. But secondly, what's woven in here is also a proximity. That is that the people that you are close with, the people that you live life with, that is that we hold one another accountable and, and we are not to go out of our way to bring judgment, but when those things pop up, we are to address them. And that's actually brotherly love. So what we see here, right, is that everything is from afar. They don't know Paul from Adam, right? This narrative here, we actually realize Paul is the hero. The idea that he is wicked or unrighteous, that he is getting what he deserves, that could not be further from the truth. He's been falsely accused as a prisoner, and all the while, he's being proven to be the saving grace throughout the entire journey. He's the one that warned them not to go uh, from uh, Crete. They went anyways. And then he rose up in leadership when everyone else fa- faded away. And in fact, on top of that, if you go back and read chapter 27, verse 24, they are all saved through Paul's prayers. Okay, 20, uh, Verse 24, 27 reads... God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. In other words, God heard Paul's prayers and the whole ship was saved because of Paul. Think about that. His leadership, his prayers are the reason that now 276 people are alive on this island. And yet when another hardship hits, the stigma 
And the narratives from the outside, from those who are far away, pounce. He's getting what he deserves. Condemnation. Justice has caught up to you. Beloved, we must not be this way as Christians. We must not. As followers of Christ, there there is clear instruction in terms of how we are to, to view and when we are to blame and enter in. And if you are not near to a situation, the whole, oh, I know her. You see the way she, uh uh-huh. Or he is getting what he deserves. And if you are not near, that must not be the way that you speak or entering into that. Because the same measure that we judge others, it will be brought to ourselves. I know I'm stepping on toes because I know that this is part of our culture and it must not be this way. Paul is not faced. It's incredible. He shakes the snake off in the fire. He knows he's not cursed. In fact, he knows he's not getting what he deserves. Because if he got what he deserved, he would be dead on the Damascus Road. But he has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit as a child of God. And any trial that comes his way is not the wrath of God. It cannot be because God is his very own father. God will use everything in his life for his good, no matter what others may think of his hardships. Verse five, however, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had been waiting a long time and seen nothing unusual happen to them, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. You see how quickly uh, public opinion can turn? Now he's a god. So if there is a ditch on one side of the road, the judgment of others in the midst of our hardship, on the other side is equally as dangerous. That is when others exalt us above our status. Paul will actually be uniquely and powerfully used by God here on the island of Malta. God spares him from death by a viper In verses seven through eight, he he heals the chief magistrate's father who's on his deathbed. That causes, in verse nine, the entire island to come to him with their diseases. And God allows him to heal them all. And although Luke gives us very little detail here, surely, if we walk through Acts, you know undoubtedly Paul used this to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Overwhelmingly, right? Right? He preached Jesus. God was giving witness on an island where his word had never gone through miracles and signs and healing so that they could grab hold of the fact that Jesus was the Christ. And history records for us that almost the entire island comes to faith and the natives will tell of Paul's shipwreck all the way until this day. So how do you think Paul responded to his elevated status of he is a God? All that public praise and attention, it so easily goes to our head. Now, I know the God part is a little silly, so change the category to most elevated celebrity or an infallible leader. All praise and glory directed towards him. You know, the vice of being used by God and then that individual getting the big head, stealing God's glory, well, that story is as old as Satan himself. And even though Luke does not detail for us Paul's response, we have a similar story from earlier in Acts chapter 14. 
Do you guys recall in Acts 14 on Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey, they went to Lystra and there was a man who had been lame from birth and they healed him. And immediately the people in Lystra thought that Paul was Hermes and Barnabas was Zeus. And they began this entire procession where they were going to sacrifice to them. And Paul and Barnabas didn't quite know what was going on until all of a sudden there's, there's this sacrifice and this entire procession. And what do they do? They tear their robes, stopping the entire thing. Then what are you doing? We are men just like you and me. We have come so that you could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, not so that you could worship us. And in fact, that very act gets them stoned. That's what got them stoned. But Paul refused to steal any of God's glory. He knew that all glory belonged to Jesus. Jesus was the one who had healed them, not him. And in fact, if you read Paul's writings, he's very concerned about this. Romans 12, 3. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. This attitude undoubtedly creeps into the church from time to time. It did in Corinth. In Corinth, people began to brag about who baptized them. I am of Paul. I am of Peter. Apollos baptized me. To which Paul replies, I wasn't crucified for you. Who am I but a servant of Jesus? Look, I planted, Apollos watered, but God is the one who caused the growth. We are all workers in God's field. It's his building. Beloved, this is an incredibly powerful warning in our day the day of the celebrity pastor, the day of the social media influencer, the day when the highest goal of our young people's lives is to become famous. When self-esteem on steroids screams, you can be anything that you put your mind to. We must pause and cleanse our hearts of the desire to steal God's glory to think more of ourselves than we ought, to believe the hype and the praise that we would receive in momentary moments of praise of the crowd instead of the audience of one. So after leaving Malta, Paul boards another Egyptian ship, and this time, maybe for the first time, it's uneventful, right? He just gets to where he's supposed to go. That's the best kind of trip, an uneventful trip. Now, we will look at more detail from chapter, chapter 28 next week, but let me quickly detail. There, there is a third audience that misunderstands Paul. Paul will set up in his home under house arrest in Rome, in his quarters. And he will call the leading uh, Jews of Rome, the leaders of, of, of the synagogue there in Rome, who will play coy and pretend that they don't know who he is. Undoubtedly, they know who he is. And as they uh, correspond with him, they are polite but if you read verse 22, they, they have this underhanded reply. We desire to hear from you what your views are, for concerning this sect, it is known to us that it has been spoken against everywhere. Now that sounds a little mundane in English until I tell you that that word for sect there is the word that we get heresy, okay? That's heresy, so, uh, you see, Paul was just a man who had been changed by Jesus Christ. Just a man who had been changed by the truth. He was allowed to see the truth with clarity. And he was bold enough to, to tell other people about Jesus. But from that day forward, everywhere that he went, he was labeled a heretic. 
Char- the Jews charged him with blasphemy. They tried to kill him, thinking that they were doing a favor to God. They hated him. And because they could not kill him, they slandered his name everywhere that he went. And for what? For testifying about Jesus Christ. John 15, 18, Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. One of the oldest pictures of graffiti in the known world is on some barracks in Rome. Now, We read in Philippians that when Paul got to Rome, that his gospel witness had gone throughout the entire uh, Praetorian Guard. Today in Rome, you can see a square of plaster cut from that wall in the barracks. And on it scratched a human figure who is crucified. But he has the head of a donkey. And a man is pictured below him worshiping that crucified donkey man. And the label reads, Alex worships his God. You see, apparently Alex was a uh, Roman soldier who heard the good news of Jesus Christ and his life has been radically transformed. He's been changed by, he came to faith, probably through Paul's influence there in Rome. But his fellow soldiers responded with hatred, mockery, slander. And what was the catalyst of such hate? It was simply the truth of Jesus Christ testifying that Jesus has changed my life. Now, just this week, there was a headline that broke that screams about how much our culture loves to mock and insult Christians. The headline from Rolling Stone read, Mike Johnson admits that he and his son monitor each other's porn intake. And when you actually read the details of the story, it reads that they had covenant eyes on their phone. A purity software that, that keeps, that holds people uh, accountable and, and as Christians says, look, I, whatever I put before my eyes, I, I, I want to be pure before the Lord. I, I want some protection. That's all it was. But, it, but yet the, the headline is intentionally written with slander and scoff. Stories underneath were a bunch of, what a bunch of weirdos. What's wrong with these people? Why would they do such like that? Now you ask yourself the question, why is it written with such insult and slander and scoffing? At the end of the day, the only answer is because they hate Jesus. Situation after situation, Paul was misunderstood. He was labeled unrighteous when hardships hit. He was elevated to receive undue praise when God performed amazing work through him. He was labeled a heretic and hated by the Jewish leaders simply for being an outspoken Christian. But all the while, Paul fixed his eyes on the audience of one. See, his identity was not based upon the approval of others. If it were, he would be back in the storm, tossed to and fro. They like me, they hate me, they love me. But that's not where he was. He was was grounded. He was steady. He was established in who he was because his identity was Jesus Christ alone. Beloved, you are not the clothes that you wear nor the car that you drive. You have been chosen from the foundation of the world. You are not your performance at work or a list of your achievements. You are an adopted child of God. 
You are not defined by your failures or your very worst sins. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You are not the sum of other people's opinions of how good or bad you are. For you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit for that day. Johnny Erickson Tata, who became a quadriplegic at the age of 17 after a diving accident, she can speak to having her identity in Christ with clarity that very few of us ever experience. So I'm going to read a long quote from her because she writes, very few of us have the luxury of coming to ground zero with God. And she says, it took me a long time to say the word luxury. Before my accident, my questions had always been, how will God fit into this situation? How will he affect my dating, my career past, the things that I enjoy? Now, all of those options are gone. It was just me, a helpless body, and God. I had no other identity but God, and gradually he became enough. I became overwhelmed by the phenomenon of the person of God who created the universe living in my life, that he was the one who could make me attractive and worthwhile. Maybe God's gift to me is my dependence upon him. I will never reach the place where I am self-sufficient, where God is crowded out of my life. I am aware of his grace to me every moment. My need for help is obvious every day when I wake up flat on my back, waiting for someone to dress me. I cannot even comb my hair or blow my nose alone. You see, she came to write that her paralysis was a luxury, a gift from God so that she could have no other identity but Christ alone. Beloved, if he is enough for someone who is paralyzed from the shoulders down, he is enough for you. Stop looking for the approval of other people. Look to your heavenly father. Live for his approval, his affection. Live for the audience of one. And there's one more thing, Johnny writes. I have hope for the future. The Bible speaks of our bodies being glorified in heaven. In high school, that was always hazy to me, a foreign concept. But now I realize that I will be healed I have not been cheated out of being a complete person. I am just going through a 40-year delay. And God is with me even through that. Being glorified, I know what that means now. That is the time after my death here when I will be on my feet dancing. I share that in with you to remind you, beloved, it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, you are our identity. You are our hope. You define us. You have given us, you tell us who we are, not the world. The world's opinion of us will vary. They they will over-exalt us or they will drag us down and the enemy will use both of those things to, to get our eyes off you. But when our eyes are on you, God, we, we are established. We are in Christ. We can see your promises with clarity and we know whose we are. Father, help us. Help us to walk in that truth. I know this morning that that you have exposed area of of our heart where right now your people are, are way too concerned with what the world thinks. 
And we need a hard reset into what you think. King Jesus, you are enough. And it is good, it is right for us to have our eyes fixed on you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. However the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you this morning, you respond with obedience, with faith. There'll be ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you if you came in with a heavy burden. Do not leave here carrying that on your own. Allow us to walk with you. If you have something to celebrate, to rejoice about, if you just wanna praise God, if you wanna use this uh, stage as, as an altar to pour out praise to the Lord, I pray that you, you feel a freedom to do so, to respond to him with a hallelujah, okay? So as God has spoken to you, you be obedient. Would you stand?